So most millennials do not participate in, in Second Life. The answer is that's true, all right? It's a virtual reality environment. Um, a lot of colleges and universities are starting to move on to Second Life in the theory that they'll bring the millennials with them. The millennials are not there. Okay. Um, millennial adults have declined from being the, those most likely to read literature in terms of the age group uh, the, um, to those least likely. Tr how many say true? That's true. It is true. It's very discouraging. I'm a librarian, so that's, that's not something I'm, I'm particularly pleased with. Uh, millennials, number 12, millennials strongly prefer experiential hands-on learning. A show of hands, yes, absolutely, strongly. I would, I would imagine we're going to hear all kinds of examples, but I want you to understand that, that that means interaction and not necessarily computer interaction. They want the face-to-face -face interaction as well. Okay, well, we should hear that. Uh, the average college debt of recent grads is more than $20,000 in rising, mm -hmm. typically nationally. True or false? True. It is true. Um, okay. Millennials invest 50% more time with user-generated content, blogs, wikis, YouTube, etc. True or false? It is true. Millennials rely primarily on the internet for their news. True or false? It is true. In fact, they're more likely to use Facebook and or Yahoo for news than they are to use a regular newspaper. A little discouraging and scary. If you ask them who their two United States senators are, almost invariably they won't be able to, to name them, and most of them won't even be able to name one. Um, millennials prefer face-to-face -face instruction. True or false? How many trues? True, you're right. About ha half of the respondents expect to spend no more than one or two years paying their dues in an entry-level job. True or false? That's true. Millennials feel perfectly comfortable speaking out to their superiors. They are socially bold, and you'll see this in a second. Millennials feel perfectly comfortable, oh, wait, I got that one. The overwhelming majority of millennials have used Facebook in the last 48 hours. True or false? True. Uh, some of these are so obvious. All right. Millennials spread word of mouth to 82% more people than the average person. Now, remember what I said before, they communicate more than in every kind of dimension. Okay? Answer is true. Okay. A television ad is the most common reason for millennials to visit a website. No, it has to do with word of mouth. They, they hear about it from their friends. All right? So that's false. Okay. So I'm not going to ask you what your scores are. <laughs> but hopefully I'll fill in some of the blanks today, and we'll have an opportunity to see um, what the, what the uh, research says. And then after we see what the research says, we're going to invite in your students who did not hear what I just have presented, and we'll see how they play out. Um, there are local differences in every instance. I've done this in Canada, I was just saying, and. They don't text message like they do in the United States or in, in Egypt or in even Guatemala. Um, and it has to do with the cost of, of text messaging in, in Canada. So while you have these little local things that will play out, what you'll see is overwhelmingly that, that this generation is, has similar characteristics and that, that it's, it's getting to be almost a global event. Um, so let's move on. So if you want a copy of this, you can download it. No need to take any notes. Um, it's all at the, you're going to be given a copy of, the, of right now of a two-page um, summary of what we're, I'm going to talk about. And on the top of that is the PowerPoint location so that you can download the PowerPoint. It'll be at the bottom of that screen. So what we're going to do is 12 to 12.50, give or take. Uh, I'm presenting a couple of minutes to bring in the students, get them all lined up. They will have no problem telling you what they think today, in spite of the fact that their own faculty are in the room, that we'll hear from them. Um, they will, then we'll uh, have a live focus group. I'm going to ask them questions. I have, I have a lot of questions. I also have to re read it for, uh, because of the IRB, I have to read a specific caveat ahead of time, et cetera. Um, and then we're going to ask them questions. Then you will have an opportunity to ask them questions. 
Um, but I'm not sure you could be heard from the back, so it might be useful to come up, come forward, and we'll just give you a mic at that particular point. And the students can have an opportunity to answer your questions as well. So in terms of the, th in case you missed it, there are three false answers. Everything else was true on the true and false qu quiz. Why do we call them millennials? Well, this, is, this is, came about uh, way back at the first, the leading edge of the millennials came of age at the turn of the century. And so the name has stuck. Uh, however, they're also called Gen Y, they're called Next Gen, there's all kinds of names. And you have to be very specific about dates, okay? The years, the years that they were born. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, by the way, this year's freshmen were four years old when the internet became big business, okay? So they don't remember an age when, it, when there wasn't an internet. Um, so they operate that way. Um, okay, this is the birth years. The GI generation is way, way back. But uh, the millennial generation, I use 1979 to 1994. Some experts, some de demographers use 1980 as a start date. Some use 1982. And 94 is a little fuzzy depending. But I'll show, you the, I'll show you the demographic issues and then you can make up your mind why it came out the way it came out. Um, the, the one, the, from my viewpoint, the oldest, the oldest millennials are now turning 30. They're actually in the workplace in many instances. Some of them are actually doctors. Some of them are actually in professional positions. Um, some, are, some are still in graduate school moving along. Uh, the youngest ones are already in high school. Um, the peak population of the millennials in terms of birth years has already passed nationally. It happened two years ago and it's already passed here in New York as well. I'll show you that as well. Okay, I've done all, these are all the states I've done this. I've, I did it in front of a, a Native American community college. I've done it in front of the University of Michigan, Georgia Tech. Um, community colleges, all kinds of, and, and four-year colleges and research institutions, et cetera. Um, basically, there's, there's, such, there's such a common element. I usually ask the faculty, I didn't ask you today, but I usually ask the faculty ahead of time, how many of you have noticed changes in the last 10 years in the behaviors of your students, those who've been around at least 10 years? How many? Let's just show our hands. Okay. A portion, but not, 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 not overwhelming, not, certainly not the majority. My key questions are, are millennials different from prior generations? Key language is at the same age. 18-year-olds behave differently than 30-year-olds, okay? So you have to take into consideration how 18-year-olds behave before. So when I, that values thing that was in the question was in here, how they're closer to their parents, 18-year-olds typically are not very close to their parents in terms of their values. They're rejecting a lot of their values. But this generation nonetheless tested closer than any generation at that same age, okay? Just to put it into context. So this, these are the years. The left side of the screen shows the baby boomers, roughly 19 years. Uh, the demographers have, and the, the United States Census Bureau and other groups have kind of designated these. But you'll see the peaks were really the reason why they, they chose to, de dem to um, signify that they have a very different kind of um, dem demographic characteristics. So the baby boomers go from 1946 to 1964 very long spread. Um, bottom line is most of the faculty in most academic institutions today still are baby boomers. Generation X is the 14 years in between and notice that there's fewer of them, okay? Each of those bars represents the birth, births at a, the particular year, um, 1972 and so forth and so on. Um, over on the right side of the screen are the millennials, 16 years and basically they go out to 1994, and except for those in high school, they're either in college or out of college at this particular point, pretty much, all right? So you have four years left in, in high school, um, and then they're gonna move on to graduate schools, and some, many of them are already in graduate schools and into the workplace. By the way, I, I get asked all the time about, are there any characteristics that I see with the younger generation, the ones who were 15 and younger, who haven't yet necessarily fully developed all of their behaviors and characteristics. And I answer with a question, what will it be like 
to live in an age where they don't experience privacy as we used to know it. All right? Um, that's, I don't know. I just, I'm wondering because I see evidence of this. Okay, so they're in the workforce. Ten years from now, in 2019, you're going to have all of the boomer or, touch, or touch, millennials in the workforce, but the one on the left side of the screen, the boomers, will actually start retiring. So what's happened is the boomers have stayed in their jobs longer because of the economy and other reasons, mostly the economy. They don't have the money to, to retire. So they're staying there longer. But within the next 10 years, they will retire. Age will, will catch up with us. And those of us who uh, would like to have some beach time will have an opportunity to have that beach time. I, by the way, I'm not a millennial. I just want to make sure everybody's <laughs> OK. So. <clears throat> Okay, so this is the demographics in the United States. Notice the peak year was 2008 in terms of births. So that was the peak millennial year, and it starts tapering off. So you saw a big, big growth before 2008. So the competition for students has started, right? It's, it means that institutions as we know them are, are going to be now scratching to try to fill up their, their in the undergraduate level, and at the graduate level in the, in the near future. So th that's the United States picture. Here's the New Jersey picture, very similar. Actually, it's a little steeper incline on the left side of the screen, showing that basically um, the millennial population increased um, in each of those years before 2008, basically from 98 to 2008. Here's Pennsylvania. So what you see is this national trend. There's New York. Now, notice that New York is a precipitous decline from 2008 on. Do you see that on the screen? So you're going to be in a special competition for, for students, all right? In terms of if, if having students is important to your college or university, then you're going to be in a special, especially if you recruit um, locally within this, within this area and within this region. Here's a study. And it's, it's very interesting, and I want to make sure I give a caveat at the beginning of this. This is one study. It's very difficult to do a study like this because you need data from the past. But this study was done at a medical school in Ohio. And what they did was they took, um, they have a 16 personality factor test that they apply against inbound medical school students to find out who makes the best surgeons, who makes the best pediatricians, who makes the best doctors, and so forth. And they got the bright idea, what if they looked at this data in terms of uh, birth year instead of at, well, what they found was startling. They found out that out of the 16 personality factors, this is a standardized test, out of the 16 personality factor test, the students scored statistically, the millennial students in, who were, who were uh, medical school students and the Gen, Gen Xers, they, they were scored significantly different on 10 of the 16 personality factors compared with the Generation X. This is not a texting behavior. This is not a behavior about how they use Facebook. This is a personality test, okay? Now, it suggests that this has been going on for a long time. What are the ways in which they're different? They test warmer, uh, more rule conscious. It's hard for me to believe that they're more rule conscious. But you have to remember, you have to compare an 18-year-old, how, how rule conscious is an 18-year-old, compared to an 18-year-old 10 years ago or 20 years ago in order to understand this behavior. Um, you'll notice social boldness on there. That's why they have no problem saying what's on their mind. Okay? They're expected to be socially bold. Um, they're open to change, more open to change. Uh, they're more sensitive and self-doubting. Thus, they tend to move, and because of the warmer characteristics, they tend to gravitate more to groups, group behavior. Word of mouth is why, why this group acts the way they do, all right? They, they, they're more likely to accept whatever their friends have said than what they hear on television or what they, what they even hear from quote unquote authorities, um, which is a problem um, because it's, it's very difficult. You don't, not everything can be learned that way. Um, so those are nine out of the characteristics. One of the interesting characteristics, I think the most interesting actually, is that in this study, 
in one characteristic, self-reliance, the individual characteristics, they test it in effect, they're less self-reliant uh, compared to Generation X. The latchkey kids, the kids who were left to their own devices when they were younger, tested higher in, in their individual ability, individualism and in their self-reliance, whereas Generation X does not. They're more likely to talk to their other friends and say, what are you going to do in this? What are you going to do in this? And, and kind of reach a consensus before they act on something. Um, by the way, one of the other things was they look at the subset from 1975 to 1980, and they called them cuspers because they tested in those 16 characteristics of the 10 that were different. You can actually see that they tested right between uh, those two groups. But this, so this phenomena has been going on for a long time. We have seen a gradual shift. Um, I'm looking for other institutions that have kept personality factor data that could be analyzed for this kind of purpose. So if your institution does and we're able to get somebody who's willing to, to help analyze it, we'd like to get some more data to prove or disprove this phenomenon. But it, it's test well because when you take these characteristics and you also apply it against specific studies about particular behaviors, you find out that they, they coincide. All right. So I, I truly believe this is, this is real, but there's not enough data here to prove it at this point. So there's a lot of characteristics where they're different than the, pre the previous generations. I'm not going to go through them. Don't be frightened. I'm not going to go through every one today. But I am going to start with the one I think is the most important. And it's not um, the, digi the digital because they're all digital. It may be a function of that in a way, but it is not because they're all digital. It's that they have more choices, more selectivity in everything that they do. All right? Now, what does that mean? That means that they don't have a generational music because they can download any song they want. And there's no, there's no um, pressure, peer pressure, in order to listen to a particular song. Now, that will vary by, by the, whatever groups they happen to be in. They're local, they're small groups the ones that they talk with all the time, et cetera. But so you will see all these choices playing out. I'll ask them today about what's their favorite type of genes. And what you will hear is not a brand name half the time. You will hear them say something, the style of the gene, the cost of the gene, uh, the color of the gene, um, wherever I can get it cheapest, as is usually the biggest, the biggest one. All right. So, the kinds of things that we used to, uh, to ascribe, like brand names and so forth, um, they, don't, they may have a brand name as an individual or as a small group, but not as a generation. So um, th this one's pretty cool. This is one by way back in 2002 by a Gen Y consumer. She said, basically, um, they have no, they're, they're, the Gen Y consumer is brand and store loyal, she said, but the store must provide choices and have them in stock. I want you to think as we go through this, what we do in higher education to provide choices, All right? Their worst nightmare is to have one faculty member in one course they have to go through, All right? And no choice. By the way, my generation would have loved to have these, um, but the fact was we didn't. And the fact is that we have learned to uh, accept that sometimes that's not going to happen. This generation hasn't learned that. They expect it. It was part of the way they grew up. Choices. It's all about choices. Um, it's, it comes down to uh, Peter or Chris Anderson's The Long Tail. Have you read, how many people have read Chris Anderson's The Long Tail? Anybody? I, I recommend this book. It's basically about the fact that you have many, many, many more choices available today because of the way the technology is. So the big brand names that you used to have, you used to have three channels when I was a kid. Then it got to be 13 channels that you could pick from. Then it got to be hundreds of channels uh, because of cable, et cetera. Then it became hundreds of channels and DVDs and so on. And then it got to be YouTube and streaming, et cetera. And now your video choices are, are huge. And this is playing out in everywhere. So what happens is they choose what they like, which, which puts the, the top, there's a big curve. And the big curve starts with the really, really popular ones and goes out in this long tail. 
and the long tail now is, is now showing itself uh, as to being where a lot of the students will go uh, for products, for services, and, and in the way they live. Um, but what's interesting is, I think it's not only happening in society, this generation is the first generation that actually lived that. They were born into it. They expect it, right? They expect choices in everything. Okay. Um, everything is personalized and customized. Um, and if I, if, if there, how many people are millennials in the room? Okay, two of you. Um, three. Yes, no. <laughs> Ah, uh, you're pulling my leg here. All right, so we have, we have two here, okay? Um, the ring on your phone, is it customized, personalized? Did you change it for anybody who calls? No, but all my friends do. <laughs> all right, typically, I, I, I like to joke that, that, you know, I'm still waiting to find the millennial who hasn't customized their product or service. They do it in everything. Um, and, and indeed, that's part of the whole Facebook phenomenon is to have their own unique look and feel, et cetera, on, the, on Facebook. So what we're seeing is this playing out, the customized and personalized is another version of choices, right? Um, that's really what it's all about. Give me choices. Um, I'm asked about this group likes to collaborate, so should they all be, should I f put them all in groups? And the answer is, what do you think? Sometimes, that's the right answer. And the sometimes should be, typically, should I have to work in a group with a group of people who don't carry their end of the loop? Or can I work in a group that, that I want to work with? And if not, I can't get into a group that, with the people that I want to work with, should I be left to do the project on my own? Right? Interesting questions, but they, they have a strong feelings in this. Let's ask them that this afternoon when they come in. Okay, they're collaborative and social networking. Um, I'm going to ask them how many of them are on Facebook. How many have used Facebook uh, probably since uh, Monday? Okay, what's today, Thursday? Well, maybe Tuesday. We'll use Tuesday as, as the test, okay? How many of you, well, all of them have used Facebook probably today, okay? And they will all probably have text this morning. Um, and by the way, they text probably to twice as many people as you texted to this morning, assuming you texted at all this morning. It also helps if I can pronounce texting. All right. Um, Team-based learning. Uh, they love the flexibility and convenience. One of the things I constantly ask, uh, I, I'll give you a typical uh, question I would ask a student. Have you ever taken a distance learning course, an online course that was entirely online? How many of you have done? So, Okay, so then I'll ask the millennials, all right, who have taken a distance learning course, did you like the experience? Some will, some won't. Of the ones who didn't, I'll ask them the question, those of you who didn't like the, the online course compared to the face-to-face, -face, they will then say, why did you like it? Well, I, I really like face-to-face, -face. it's more engaging, and especially if the faculty member is, you know, interactive, et cetera. And, and then I say, well, why, did you, why do you take do you, would you still take distance learning courses? And the answer was, of course, because it's convenient. I can take it at the time I want to take it. I can take it, I can avoid a professor X if I, because I can, take, I can take the distance learning course as an alternative, all right? What it tells you is the flexibility and convenience comes back to that sense of choices again, all right? It's really how they operate. Um, okay. Disturbing to me, by the way, there's lots of studies involved in here. Uh, I'm not going to, if you really want more detail, I, I suggest that you look at some of these. There, here's one by Price Waterhouse Coopers about uh, flexibility and so forth. All right, I'm going to move through these real, real quick. They read less. They don't read the newspaper. Um, they don't read literature like they used to, to read. They just plumb read less. They deny it because they say that we read, um, you know, we read on the web. We, we go to a, so, but when you ask them specific current events questions, like something that might have been in the news, like in the last few days, who are the major candidates running for New York? Uh, no, nah, they wouldn't know that. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's ask a question. Would they even know about, uh, let's say, um, the, the murder of this co-ed um, that's been in the news locally? Maybe, we could find out today. 
Um, but you're, they're not going to tell you who the U.S. senators are. And if I ask them to, to tell, tell me uh, what the major news story of the day is, uh, they're very unlikely to be able to give you that information. And that comes back to how they get their information. Very disturbing, by the way. Um, okay, experiential and interactive. By experiential and interactive, I am saying that they want to be involved in it or they feel like, even if they don't want to be involved in it, they would rather be involved in it than be bored to death. Okay? So lectures are much less inviting to them than, than to be involved. Um, in fact, all of them will ask, you'll, I'll ask them how many, of th how many of them think that their average lecture is exciting. And then I'm going to ask them how many, I'll ask the second question, how many of you will find your average lecture boring? All right? And what you'll hear, what you'll see is the result of that. And then when they talk about their favorite academic experiences, I'm going to leave it at favorite academic experience. I'm not going to say in a classroom or outside of a classroom, et cetera. You will get this whole idea of engagement, of interactivity, and why it's really, really, really important to them. This, they grew up with this. They expect it. Uh, they had it in all of their activities. Um, they were always involved in collaborative kinds of activities. They were always involved in uh, being taken to events and so on. So the experiential and interactive is their strong preference. It's hands-on learning. It's problem-based learning. Okay? Okay. Um, yes, they want to use the technology, but it's not just the technology. I just want to remind you, yes, the technology is very involving to them, especially if it's a gaming type of, of technology and so on. But it's not the only, only way. They also want the interactive face-to-face -face with a faculty member. Um, it may, basically means that the mentoring and the interactive piece is really what we really should be doing after it all gets said and done. Um, so the active involvement in the learning process facilitates social settings, problems. Some of these are things that we've already known for years. Uh, we have known for years, in the 1980s, there were studies done by Benjamin Bloom that proved conclusively that there was a huge, huge success rate uh, with students who were personally tutored compared to those who were in a classroom. Well, of course, we understand this. So why haven't we done it? Well, the we can't have personal tutors for everybody. So why is it that a personal tutoring works so much better? Because they not only know what the person needs to know, but the systems can know what they know at any given period of time and can adjust to what they know. It can, it can say the last time this student got this, this piece wrong and test them on it and ask questions about it, et cetera. So the technology offers its opportunities to, to bring the personal tutoring, the machine tutoring, if you will, into the equation. But does it mean that we aren't is more important in this process? Actually, it reverse is true. We actually become very important. Um, Virginia Tech, put uh, they call it the Math Emporium together. It's this huge, huge lab. Um, it had a, a few weaknesses. One of the weaknesses was that it was off campus, off the main part of the campus. And the second weakness was that they didn't provide the same level of interactivity in terms of the, of the faculty member or the graduate student, whoever was helping. They tried, but it was mostly machine-based. Sh machine the students did not take to it as they did in other operations. Much, much more effective in terms of scoring, et cetera, but much less desirable in terms of the way they, they learn. Um, there's other examples of that where they have been very successful. I'll, I won't get invited to Virginia Tech to do this presentation, I'm sure. Um, OK, they, they want hands-on approach to learning. This is kind of interesting. Uh, this is some statistics. What is the average number of questions that a student asks in a, an hour of a class? Uh, apparently, it's one-tenth of a question per hour. Okay? So for every 10 hours of class time, they'll, at, the average student will ask one question. Highly interactive, right? How many does the, does the faculty member ask of a particular student in the average class? How do we know whether they've learned it unless we've asked the question or what they've learned? We just rely on the test at the end of this. All right? Um, so the question is one. Uh, excuse me, uh, point, point three is the faculty member. I had a point three. 
So the faculty member will ask that student three questions for every 10 hours of class time. All right? That's really what it comes down to. And that's the reason why they find most lectures boring. And why they're looking at, say, hey, we can listen to the lecture on, on a podcast um, and get all that information. And by the way, I can do it when I'm on the bus, doing my laundry, or whatever else. Do, help me in the class understand what it is I'm supposed to be learning. Okay? Make it interactive and personalized and customized to who I am and what I'm trying to learn. So I, there's some material here on problem-based learning, but I'm going to skip over it at this point because I'm assuming that you know most of that. Um, the key is, do we want our students, do we want to be known as the best teacher, or do we want our students to be known as the best learners? The way in which you approach that is different upon, depending upon how you answer that question. Okay? We assume that all learning is through teaching in the classroom. That's just not the way it happens. You know that because you sit through this yourself. You, have all, you didn't come here as an empty slate. And yet, yet what we really know is that what, what they want to do is learn how to learn and be able to do it fast enough that they can, they can be successful. Um, so the, the way in which you become learning-centered are very different. It has to do with the quality of the students around you, the, all of these materials. I'm not going to spend all today doing that. But it gets to the heart when you hear the answers to their questions about their favorite and least favorite academic experiences. Start putting it into this context, please. OK. Um, I said they communicate a lot. Here's the data. Um, 13 to 17 year olds have a 7.5 ratio of text to voice. Do you see that? I don't know. Can you see the screen in the back? Yeah. All right. Um, notice that if in the 18 to 24 year olds, it's 2.9 text to, uh, to voice. They actually wind up in jobs at some point, and they can't text all day, so they, it only goes down to a mere 2.9. Okay. Um, then you look at the 45-year-olds, okay, that 0.7, they actually text less, less than they voicemail, right? So it gives you some notion of how the, how the communications actually take place. Here is a graph of that same one. I don't know whether you can see it in the back, but there's a very high bar which shows you the texting. But if you look at the bottom of this screen here, where's my pointer? Here it is. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll actually see that 18 to 24 year olds peak in terms of voice communications and, they have, and it just declines from thereafter. So whether you look at voice communications or you look at texting or you look at other forms of communication, they're the communicators. Now, some, some people have said, well, of course, that's where the hormones are, are all flowing. And, and, he, and that's maybe partly true, but it's also true that th this has effects upon the way in which uh, they learn, the way in which they, they seek approval, the way in which they look for their products and services, et cetera. Okay. Whoops. Sorry. Um, here's re recent data that the average adult uh, Twitters 12.5%, 12.5% of the adults Twitter, whereas 6% of the uh, millennials, young, young folks, are twittering. Um, the bottom line is neither group is a majority of the group. Um, so I, I keep hearing that every, all these millennials are out there twittering and you should, we should build our services for some kind of twittering. Well, twittering is, what is it? I forget how many characters. Any, who can help me with 140? 140 characters. Well, if you can't say it in 140, it's, the, it's, it's, like, it's like a sound bite. Um, can you truly put anything really, really meaningful into the sound bite? Um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to play on that. I just want you, want you to understand that they don't find it as, as meaningful um, a tool, uh, and it, neither do they find Second Life a meaningful tool. They are digital natives, and that's so obvious that I'm not even going to go through it. One of the important parts is that they do instant message um, quite frequently. Um, because they can and because it's cheap and be, uh, it becomes annoying, in fact, to other adults. If they will, they'll do that while they're doing everything else to boot. 
Um, so while you're in the room with your millennial child or, or relative or whatever, um, they will be on the computer, probably listening to some music at the same time, but spending quality time with you. Almost all of them have been gamers. And the key here is how many hours they spent gaming uh, before they got to adulthood. That has, they said that to become an expert in anything, you spend 10,000 hours at it. And the evidence is that they have spent, on average, by the time they graduate from college, 10,000 hours. And this is women as well as men. Uh, women play different games. They were much more likely to play role-playing games, not the violent games, et cetera. But when you take, when you take, take a look at it, the interactivity and so forth involved in it, it's no wonder that, that they have a lot of the um, behaviors and, and attitudes that they have. Okay. Um, they're practical and achievement oriented. Tell me what I need to get an A in this class and only what I need to get an A in this class. All right? Or maybe I'll settle for a C. Tell me what I need to get a C and only what I need to get a C. Uh, the point is, they are, that's, that's what they want. They want it in bite, bite sizes, practical. Um, unfortunately, that's, it serves them in many ways, but in other ways it doesn't serve them. Um, they, for example, one of the ways in which they behave, if it's a big decision, choice of college, they make the choice of college on the last day that they can apply for the college. And the reason for that is, why? Any guesses? They may change their mind. They may change their mind. She's right. That's exactly it. They have more choices, right? There might be other choices that will come. Why should I make my choice now if I get a better one might come tomorrow? All right? That's the way in which they behave. Um, it also changes a lot about the speed with which they do things. All right. They're impatient. This is huge. Ask yourself the question, why they text message to start out with? Why do they go to the Facebook? Why do, they, why do they behave in the, many of the ways that they behave? And the answer is it's faster. Okay? They don't have to have a conversation. I don't have to say hello, how are you? I can send it to six people at the same time. So they don't make plans necessarily ahead of time. They do it on the spot. Now, the problem with being an educator is that in some fields, like, say, surgery, you know, you really want to plan ahead, right? And, and some, at, at some point, we have to teach them um, how to plan ahead. But I don't think they're actually being taught. In fact, everything is running the other way. It's all about experiential learning, learning on the spot, uh, learning by trial, by trial and error learning, et cetera. So they have this sense that they're busy all the time. Don't bother me. I've got this going on. I've got that going on. And they probably are when you consider all of the text messaging and everything else that they're doing. All right? Um, it, it's, it's, but it's the sense that they have that they're very, very busy. They're a pull generation, not a push generation. By this, I'm talking about the marketing. Uh, mass media, if you put an ad in, let's say, a newspaper, you're, forget it. You're not going to get them to read it. If you put an ad on TV, maybe a percentage of them will get it, but they're much more likely to hear about anything important from their neighbors. And their neighbors are their immediate circle of friends. Okay? So it, what a lot of the industries are starting to do is moving into the word, word of mouth. How do we get into that cycle? How do we change, change it? Um, they get, they're overwhelmed with information. And so the reaction is, I'll, I'm going to take it from my personal filters. My personal filters are my group of buddies that, that I work with. Um, so they're much more oriented toward pull, not to push technology. Mass media it just doesn't have the same effect on them that it had on our generation. Uh, in fact, I like the, the comment about the inversion of power. It used to be that the mass media controlled a lot of what was actually being done, and now they, they're, they're lagging. They're trying to figure it out themselves. Sort of the opposite of what happened with, well, I, I'll leave that thought, forget that. <laughs> um, they are multitaskers. Um, there's some evidence both ways on this score, but they believe that they're better multitaskers than um, the generation ahead of them. 
There's some study that says maybe that is true. There's also studies that indicate that multitasking is, there's a recent study actually that came out that says that those people who believe that they multitask more actually multitask less effectively than those people who don't do it on a regular basis. Um, so th this in SUNY, um, this is, well, this is probably not, this is a good example of a, where they, the podcasting, students who took podcasts instead of going to the lectures, took notes in the podcasts, all right, detailed notes, did 10% better in their coursework than those students who went to the classes and took notes, all right? Now, why do you think that might happen? Any guesses? They have control of the, of the stream. That's right, exactly. So they can, say, they can rewind it, listen to that section they just missed, all right? They can say, hold it, <laughs> I want to write this note down. So they're take, they're, it turns out they take more detailed notes as a result of that. Now, it turns out there's no essential difference if they don't take detailed notes, all right? So it turns out they, 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 uh, they do it no, no more effectively than if they were in the class. Okay. Um, and, of course, it doesn't in any way they, uh, mean that, that the, the faculty or the students believe that they would be more effective without the face-to-face -face instruction. In fact, both groups think the face-to-face -face instruction is critical, but they look at it very differently, what face-to-face -face instruction means. We're still in the sage on the stage thinking in many instances. Um, they're more involved with media of all ki kinds. So they're more likely to have been on YouTube since you've been on YouTube. If I were to go around the room and ask everybody when you were last on YouTube, et cetera. Okay, I've got to, we're about ready to reach the students. Let me finish the last couple here. Um, so their favorite online uh, multimedia environment or millennial environment is virtual, interactive, multimedia, full motion, personalized, customized, and socially networked, just like our classrooms. Okay? And that's the key. How do we do this? And we need to rethink how we're doing it. I usually get three faculty reactions to the research. One is still disbelief. There's a small percentage who say studies can't, these studies are not right. They're, they're wrong and flawed in some fundamental way. The second group, the bigger group, it says, I've taught for, you fill in the line, X number of years. Um, I know how to teach it they have to learn to adjust to it, all right? In spite of the fact that there are gonna be co more competition for these students and the fact that they clearly behave differently, okay? And the third group says, well, how do we change how we, uh, we better, how can we change to better engage these students in their learning, all right? And I hope at the end of this that I leave you with that question. How can we change to better engage the students in their learning? And what can we do? Not necessarily just as individuals, but in the groups, in our, in our college, in our university, and even, even outside of that. Um, I'm gonna skip over that. Uh, there's a few other facts. Can we bring in the students? I'll just tell you a couple of the other facts before they come in. 30% um, of them or more de uh, define themselves as liberal compared to 20% about 10 years ago. Um, they're much more politically engaged they actually changed the election. The, 60, the only group that voted for Bush, uh, excuse me, for um, John McCain in the last election was uh, the oldest group. They were the only group that went the majority for, and, and they won, the, their slice of the pie, the percentage of them, that number that voted was much smaller. So what we have seen is the political engagement has increased. Um, much more socially involved. Um, they are, they have more friends. You will see this come out when I ask them the question in a couple minutes. And, and those, they have uh, very high expectations. Whoop. All right, let me take this off of here. I don't want it to be up when they come in. Any quick questions before they arrive, the students arrive? Yes, sir. Of different cultural backgrounds, immigrants, stuff like 
Well, as I said, I did this in Guatemala, I did it in Egypt, and I did it here. And what I have seen is, ready. we're ready. Uh, if, you, if you speak English, if you have constant broadband internet access, these are the givens, all right? Um, and you're a college age student, you would, you would not know any difference in terms of their, these kinds of behaviors that we're talking about, all right? So whether you were, in fact, they're closer to, in, for example, the Egyptian group was closer to their American counterpart students than they were to their own parents and the, and the older groups in their own country. Um, it, there, are variant, there are variances in terms of some local condition, but bottom line is diversity does, I did it at an American Indian community college with essentially the same results that I, I did at the University of Michigan. <laughs> All right, audience reminder, you will be given an opportunity to ask them questions um, as we get to the end of this, of this uh, focus group. Okay, <clears throat> does everybody understand uh, that they have the right to pass or any questions? Okay, shake your, head, shake your head if you, all right. Okay, you also realize that this is being videotaped, right? Yes. Okay, <laughs> just to let you know, and, and you also recognize that I'm not going to ask you any questions, nor do what I expect any answers that you wouldn't want your parents to hear. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so I would like you to, Lior, is it? How do you, would you please introduce yourself, uh, tell us your major, your year, and one interesting thing about yourself, please. Yeah, why don't we take the microphones all out? Can everybody grab one? Okay, you'll have to pass it back and forth. We'll go right up this way. Go ahead. My name is Lior. Uh, I was born in the year 1991. And my intended major is to be a physician assistant, to be in the program. And uh, what other questions? Okay, uh, your date of birth? Uh, November 30th. No, I don't need the month, just the year. 1991. 1991, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Okay, and one interesting thing about yourself. Uh, pass. Uh, Pardon? I don't know. Just All right, pass. we'll pass. Christopher. My name is Chris, and my major is comp computer science, and I was born in 1991, and I'm a good basketball player. Oh, cool. All right. Thanks, Chris. <coughs> Um, my name is John. I was born in 1991, and uh, my career that I'm choosing to is to be a psychologist. And one interesting thing about me is that um, I like uh, rock music. I like rock music. Yeah, uh, that's good. I'm coming back to you, John. <laughs> Alicia. Hi, my name is Alicia. I was born in 1990. Um, my major is physician assistant. And one interesting thing about me is. I have about um, 20 cousins in New York, and I'm the oldest but shortest out of all of them. You're the <laughs> oldest and the shortest. But good things come in small packages. I just want you to know. I'm sure you've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, OK. Um, hi, my name is Elizabeth, and I was born in 1990. My major is also a physician assistant. And one interesting thing about me is that I <laughs> I'm an active volunteer at Beth Israel Hospital. That's it. <laughs> okay, so you actively volunteer at the hospital yourself? Yeah. Cool. How many other people, just show of hands, how many people have volunteered, say, in the last six months at some facility, some, some institution, somewhere? Show of hands. Okay. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. My name is Orlando Torres. I'm a business, administ a business administration major. I was born in 1990, and one interesting fact about me is I'm very, very organized. All right. Is that super organized? Yeah, I would say super. All right. Hi, my name is Stacy Ruiz. I was born um, in 1998. No, 1989, sorry. <laughs> so that makes you older than the others here. 1989. Um, my major, is, uh, my major is in psychology, and one interesting fact about What year are you in? I'm a junior. You're a junior, OK. Uh, one interesting fact about me is I um, like sign language, and I want to pursue more in sign language. Very good. Thank you. 
My name is Megan Figueroa. Um, I was born in 1989. My major is um, gerontological studies, and um, one interesting fact about me is that I suffer from hypoglycemia. Okay, hopefully under, under control? Yeah. Good. Hi, my name is Nanaya. Um, I was born in 1981. I'm majoring in medical technology, hoping to become a gynecologist. One interesting thing about me is that I'm so friendly. You can talk to me anytime, anywhere, and I'll just attend to you. Thank you. Okay, hi, my name is Sabrina Mason. Uh, I was born in 1988. Um, my major is biology and performing arts. And an interesting thing about me is... What's your major, what year? I'm sorry. What, um, junior. You're a junior? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. One interesting thing about me is um, I was a classically trained ballerina since the age of two. Wow. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Oh. Hi, my name is Stephanie Rodriguez. I was born in 1988. Okay. Um, my major is psychology and I'm a minor in theater. One interesting thing about me is that I love to dance. I love to make up dances and stuff. <laughs> oh, cool. Hello, my name is Iris Leda Duran. I am 21 years old and I'm a senior. Oh, the year 1988, sorry. <laughs> and something interesting about me is I love dancing to my country's music. Which is? Dominican Republic. Oh, Merengue, right. bachata, perico ripiao. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Get those hips moving. Hi, my name is Christina. Um, I was born in 1988. My major is music, and interesting fact is that I am a guitarist and songwriter. Okay, thank you. All right, um, my name is Dwayne, Dwayne Garth. I was born in 1986, and I, I would say the most interesting about me is I enjoy meeting new people all the time. That's very good. That'll always stay in you in good stead. Hi, everyone. My name is Sabina Paul. I was born in the year 1987. My major right now is medical technology. And one interesting thing about me is that I am the president of the York Meditation Yoga Club. So come by. Oh, thank very you. Good. I forgot to say what uh, my major was. Okay. <laughs> Accounting and finance. Accounting and finance, okay. Uh, Sabina. You have, let's give the microphone back to Sabina. Sabina, what was the last piece of music that you listened to that you chose? The last. This do is you, a hard decision. Do you want um, like specifics as to the genre? Well, tell me the, tell the, t yeah, tell the title and then the genre. Oh. Or if you can't remember the title, just tell us the genre. Reggae. Reggae? Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Dwayne? <coughs> Same question. Last piece of music that you listened to that you chose? That I chose? Um, Last piece. If you can, by title, give it to us. I appreciate it. Well, I don't know the title, but it was more, it was actually classical music. And I don't classical know music. Title. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Christina, same question. Um, the title is Ain't No Rest for the Wicked by a band called Cage the Elephant. And what would you call the genre of that music? Alternative rock. Alternative rock. Thank you. Um, the song name is Goodbye by Secondhand Serenade. It's alternative rock also. Alternative rock too. Okay. Um, by the way, are any of you folks uh, close friends of each other? Yes. 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 Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Just want to make sure we understand this. Um, how many, how, well, w we'll get to that later on. Go ahead. Stephanie. Um, the song that I chose was uh, Teardrops of My Guitar on My Guitar by Taylor Swift, which is uh, country, I guess. Country? Yeah. Okay. Um, the last song I listened to was um, La Dueña del Swing, which is merengue. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, I don't really remember the song, like the the title of the song, but it was more of a gospel song. Gospel? Yeah, gospel song. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The last song I listened to was um, Blurry by Puddle of Mud. What, what, what's the genre of music? Alternative rock. Alternative rock, okay. The last song 
I listened to was, um, I would have to say, okay, Beyonce's performance at the VMA Awards of Single Ladies, that would be the last thing. Okay, for the audience, what would you call, classify that genre of music? Um, How do you classify it? R&B. R&B, rock and Yeah. Okay. The last song I listened to was titled Empire State of Mind. Rhythm and Blues. Pardon? The last song I listened to is titled Empire State of Mind. And what kind of genre? Rap slash hip hop. Rap, hip hop. Okay, thank you. Um, the last song that I listened to was another Beyonce song, but it's called Get Me Bodied. And it's also like a pop R&B song. Pop R&B, mm -hmm. rhythm and blues kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Alicia. Another sad love song, Tony Braxton. I guess that's R&B, I guess. Yeah. Okay. R&B too, all right? Um, the last song I listened to was uh, Kings of the Carnival by uh, a band called Demo Borger, and uh, that's black metal. Okay. The last song I listened to was called Already Home, and it's hip-hop. Hip-hop, okay. The last song I listened to was Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana. It's like grunge rock, I don't know. Okay. So what I was trying to demonstrate here to the audience was that your generation has the opportunity to pick whatever music you like, so you're as likely to say classical music as R&B or country or, or gospel or um, merengue uh, as, as anything else, okay? Um, that wasn't necessarily true in the past, okay? And I think we pretty much demonstrated it's a little bit, a little bit heavy in one, one area. Um, through what piece of equipment do you, do you, did you listen to that song? How many of you heard it on, let's say, an, iP an iPod or similar MP3 kind of portable device? Show of hands. Almost all of you. Okay. How many of those who didn't raise their hands, how many of you listened on some other device? Um, on a computer. On a computer? Yeah. How many of you listened on a computer other than, okay. Three or four of you. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, television. Television. Okay. Anybody else? We covered the ground. Okay. Christina? My car radio. Your car radio. Amazing. <laughs> One heard it on the radio. Does that tell us anything? Okay. So how many of you have purchased or downloaded a song from iTunes since the beginning of uh, the school year? Purchased. No. Keywords. <laughs> I said purchased. Okay. How many of you have downloaded, not purchased, downloaded a song from any source since the beginning of the semester? Okay. Just want you to, all right. I'm not asking you. I'm not asking you. All right. Um, so what is your favorite kind of jeans, Lior? Favorite kind of jeans? Uh, Levi's. Levi's, okay. Christopher, do you have a favorite kind of jeans? No, I don't. You don't have any? No. So what's your answer to that question? What's your favorite kind of jeans? Um, I don't have a favorite. Okay, I don't have a favorite. John, you have a favorite type of jeans? They, uh, it's called PRPS. Okay. Alicia? DKNY. DKNY. Okay, Elizabeth? Um, Joe's jeans. Jones? Joe's, like... Joe. Joe's. Joe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Joe. Orlando. I like um, true religion jeans, but I don't really have that much money to buy it. <laughs> to, to buy those pair of jeans, so I stick with Levi's. Okay. That's, that's not untypical, by the way. Just go ahead. I don't want you to think that, all right, because they laughed at it. It's not untypical. Okay. Um, any jeans that fit nice, that it don't matter yeah. to me. Fit Just nice. the ones that fit nice, cost a good price. Fit nice, yeah. mm -hmm. good price. Megan? Stacy kind of stole my answer, but yeah. <laughs> Anything that fits nice is no, nothing okay. specific. Nana? Nana? Okay. Um, I don't really have a favorite like jeans type, but like any jeans that like attracts me, I just get it. Okay, whatever you like. Yeah, whatever. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, I also don't have a favorite kind of jeans. Um, as long as it, once it looks good to me, I'll buy it. Or yeah, and okay. as well. So it has to look good. Yeah. All right. Has to have fit right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Stephanie. 
Well, I don't really like name brands. I don't really care about it. So okay. as long as, well, I like uh, bell bottoms or, you know, things. I don't like tights, like uh, tight jeans, okay. like skinny jeans. I really don't like. I like bell bottoms or flares. Okay. Yeah. So the style of the jeans and the cut of the jeans are more important to you. Yeah. Okay. Like things I actually like. I don't care about what's in or anything. Okay. I'm the opposite. I like it tight, nice, and fit. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But you, it, the fit is important to you. The, yes. the cut of the jean is really important. Both Skinny. of you, the cut is, you like different cuts, but you both like the cut of the jean. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, mine would be straight leg Arizonas. Okay. Uh, I would say fitted academics. Okay. Um, I don't have a favorite, but I basically, I mean, it's the same answer as the majority of people. Something that fits well. And I don't like tight jeans either because they're not good for the health of your legs. Okay. Thank you. All right. So what you, what you saw was the practical piece of this thing starts showing up and that there's not a generational brand that everybody, everybody has. Um, and, and what they care about is what they care about. The cut of the gene or the cost or they don't care at all, one or the other. I mean, that comes across. All right, how many of you, show of hands, how many of you have used Facebook today? <laughs> okay, how many of you, you have used Facebook in the last 48 hours since Tuesday? Yeah. Everybody, okay. Um, so how many of you are on um, MySpace? Show of hands. Uh, two that are not, it looks like three that are not out of the group. Okay. Um, how many of you are on some other social networking site? And if so, what is, what's social networking? Yes. AIM. AIM. Okay. Anybody else? How many, how many are on AIM? Okay. Fairly large group of you. Okay. Um, they're going to run to their computers and find out what AIM is as soon as this is over. <laughs> uh, okay. So how many of you, um, let's, sorry, I'm going to skip a couple questions here. What's your preferred uh, communication method for the faculty member to try to reach you uh, at school? Uh, how many would say to that email? How many would say text message? Wait a minute, is that a yes or no? Okay, let's try, let's try text message again. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. All right, uh, how many of you uh, would prefer um, chat? How many of you would prefer, how many of you would prefer to uh, have the, a telephone conversation? With your faculty member? Yeah. Okay. How many of you would prefer to have a face-to-face -face meeting with your faculty member? Okay. All right. So how many of you are worried about balancing your work and personal obligations? How many of you feel like your life is so busy that you have trouble balancing everything? Maybe it's about five of you. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions about uh, technology and we're going to try to do this in a way where uh, I'm going to ask you when was the last time you used it and then I'll get back to specifics. How many of you own a smartphone with computer access so that you can get access to the web on your, on your phone? Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. About half of you have smartphones. How many of you own a laptop? Okay, we have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, slightly more. A little bit less than the national average. Na national average is now about 60 some percent uh, in typical colleges. Um, how many of you brought your personal laptop to campus today? Nobody. Uh, typically, it's about five or six percent of the students who own laptops bring them to class on any given day. Um, Typically, the universities and colleges don't have facilities to um, store the, the computers and protect them, um, and they, they can't get them powered up, and they can't carry all their books and the computer many times, so it's just not being done. Educause has, gives lots of studies on all of this. 
Um, how many of you uh, text messaged this today, sent a text message today? Okay. Um, how many of you have text messaged today? <laughs> All right. How many of you have text messaged more than once today? How many of you have text messaged more than once today? All right, about five. The start, number starts going down. Okay. How many of you have read the newspaper this morning or yesterday morning and can tell me if I ask you what uh, about a specific event that was on the front page of the newspaper? How many of you read the newspaper today and could answer the question? Okay. Um, how many of you read the newspaper in the last week? Wait, online? does online count? <laughs> well, does online help? Hey, we're talking about paper here for the moment. All right. Okay, just we're, we're, we're going to get to that. We're just talking about paper here for the moment. Okay. So, um, how do you get your news, Elizabeth? Where's your, would you hand that? Um, from what other people tell me, sometimes when I go on the computer, the main page is a news story. What computer? What, where, where are you on the computer? What do you mean? In my house? In my no, home? no. When you, when you go on to a story, what are you looking at? What screen, what, what oh, site are you looking at? Usually when I go check my email, Yahoo, they have like... Yahoo. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How many of you get your, your, that's the primary source of your news, Yahoo? Maybe two or three. How many say AOL? I say on the phone. So we have about half a dozen. Um, who has another site? Face, how many say Facebook? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how many say CNN online? Three, four. Okay. Uh, anybody else I missed? Yes? MSN. MSN. Thanks. Very good. Okay. Um, okay. How many of you watched television in the last 24 hours? I'm talking about real TV now. Not, I'm not talking about YouTube. I'm not talking about uh, DVDs or, OK, real television. OK. Um, how many of you listened to the radio in the last 24 hours? OK. Um, how many of you went to YouTube in the last 24 hours? OK, how many of you have ever um, sent a YouTube, a contributed and added a video to YouTube. That's about average. There's it's a very small percentage of actual contributors uh, to YouTube in the, in the final analysis, but everybody uses it. All right, um, let's start back over here. Sabina, how many, how many close friends, would you take the mic? Thanks. Uh, Sabina, how many close friends would you say you have? They, People that you contact, that you're in touch with very frequently? About five. Five? Yeah. Okay. Dwayne? I would say three. Three? Yeah. About two or three. Two or three? Four. Okay. Stephanie? Four. Four? Four. <laughs> One. One? Yeah. Okay. About two. Two? About? About. You're not sure. <laughs> okay. Mm. Five. Five. Okay. Four. Four. Three. Four. Five. Four. Four. Okay. How many of you instant messaged or chatted in the last 24 hours? Okay. And how many of you have ch uh, instant message in the last week? Even, and that includes Facebook as an example. All right, everybody. Okay. Um, and how many people are on your buddy list on the uh, when your chat group, an instant message group? Lior. How many how many buddies do you have on your instant message group? Uh, like 40, 50. 40 or 50. Okay, Christopher. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but it's, it's around like 70, 80. 70 or 80? Okay. Uh, like 35, around 35. All right, 35. Um, around 60. 60. I don't use instant messaging. Okay. Thank you. 30. 30. About maybe 100. 100. Okay. I would say about 30. 
30? Like 26, 27, okay. not that sure. Um, I think mine is around 100, but cause only because some people have multiple screen names. Okay. Yeah. Mine is around like 30, 35. About 90. Okay. About 20 to 25. Um, 60. Mine is about 30 to 50, but about 10 that I actually care to talk to. All right, so a lot of them are, are, are people who used to communicate with at one time or another, but you don't do that much anymore. Is that correct? Okay. Um, so um, you, had, you, you didn't instant message. You're the only one who doesn't instant message among the group. Do you have a reason why, or are you just not interested in it? Um, I feel like it's a waste of time. Like, if I need to talk to you, I'm going to have your number, so I will just text you or something. Okay. But none of you were saying that you wanted your faculty members to instant message you. Why not? It's unethical. It's weird. You want to use the microphone and tell us. Okay. I would feel like I'm talking to a friend. Like, it changes the whole relationship, you okay. know? Okay. All right. So it's too personalized, the communication tool yes. for you? Okay. Anybody else? Is that pretty much co covered for everybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Um, how many of you do other things while you're instant messaging? So you do multiple things. What, what are you likely to do, Chris? Listen to music or... Yeah, pretty much either listening to music or, or even watching something. Or even watching a video or a TV yeah. or something? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, Orlando? Sorry, we have to pass the mic back and forth. It takes time. I do a lot of things, like a thousand things. I eat, I watch the Yankee game, I listen to music. How many people do the similar kinds of things? Not necessarily the same things, but similar yes. kinds of things. Yeah. All right, when they're instant messaging. Okay. Or text messaging. Um, is the same thing? Is it the same? Okay. Um, all right. I, I, you mentioned before how many friends you have. I'm, I'm just interested in this question because there's national statistics. I don't know how it plays out locally here. But how many people are of a different, uh, how many of your friends, your close friends, you said you had three, some kind of case, one, some had one, some had five. How many of your friends, close friends, are of a different ethnicity than you are? Uh, Lear? Uh, like two or three are different. Two or three? Okay. Chris? Two. Two? Two or three. Um, majority of them is from the West Indies. Okay. One. Two. Majority is Spanish. I'm Spanish. I, I don't know. My friends are mostly Spanish. Okay. Uh, same thing. The, ma the majority of the people I talk to just happen to be Spanish. Okay. Um, I said one, so I have only one. Like, she's, we are from the same, I mean. You're the same ethnicity. Yeah. Okay. Um, same. We're all the same. Okay. Um, I have one that she's Italian and I'm Hispanic, so. <laughs> okay. I have three from the same, and well, they're all from the same Hispanics, but the one of them is from a different country. Okay. Of my close friends, all of them would be of a different ethnicity than myself. Okay. Um, different country, same as uh, ethnicity. All of them are different. All of them are different? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not unusual, by the way. That's, that's getting to be much more, more, more true. The, there's a much higher degree of diversity than ever before. How many of you, show of hands, how many of you have played a Game Boy, an internet, a video, or any other electronic game uh, yesterday or today? Okay, four. How many of you did it, let's say, any time over the summer? Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to skip ahead to some academic questions, okay? We're really going to get serious here. I would like you to tell me how many of you think that your average uh, college lecture was interesting and exciting. 
average college lecture. All right? Show of hands. Show of hands. How many of you think that your average college lecture was interesting and or exciting? OK. Yeah. All right. It depends on the subject. All right. It depends on the subject. All right, let me ask you a question a different way. How many of you think that your average college lecture is boring? OK. And who would like to speak up on the issue? Go ahead. I believe that the professors should be more enthusiastic and like more, even though if they don't have a hyper sense of self, but like, like they could give us more, what's it called, I forgot. Is that awesome? <laughs> how many people, how many of you agree with that statement? Okay. Uh, anybody else? Christina? I think that a lot of the material that's covered in most courses is just very dry material, with the exception of like, you know, I take a couple of media courses, so that's not dry material. But when the material's dry, it's really hard to make it interesting, and some professors just don't make that effort at all. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I agree with her as far as that goes, because uh, a lot of the times you're sitting there, you, you, it's, it's like you're hearing a monotone. You don't hear, you know, emotion in, in it like you as if they like the subject you, you they, they're just basically teaching you know and yeah if they don't like the subject you know why should I enjoy being there too you know okay um, I saw a bobblehead over here <laughs> do you want to comment on it anybody else want to comment okay um, I would like you to tell me now in as concrete detail as you can one day one time in college that was your best learning experience, right? I want you to put us, put us where you were. What, was, what made this your best learning experience in college, okay? And, and tell us where it was to, you know, I don't want to embarrass anybody so you can leave out specific names of people, but just tell us, tell us what your best learning experience was in college. Who would like to begin? Stephanie, you're, you're up. Um, well, my best college experience for learning was uh, in the theater. No matter what class I took in theater, I just loved it. Why? I don't know. They just made it ex uh, exciting. It was like just me acting out there or building the set. Like just me like uh, being active towards it is like it's something to do. It's not really like you're learning from it. Like, like I mean, you're learning from it, but I mean, you're not actually. Uh, like reading it, like just sitting down, doing work, you're actually participating. Okay, you're participating, very good. Okay, who else? I want everybody to, to speak on this, but I'm gonna start with the first ones who are volunteering. Um, last semester I was going to a, a college in Florida and I, I would say all my classes were actually the best, <clears throat> excuse me, the best learning experience that I've had in, in school. Why? As far as college goes, um, because the, the 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 instructors were enthusiastic about their their what they were teaching. I had math, speech, and and English, and they were very enthusiastic about what they taught, and they made it they they made it interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, anybody else want to volunteer before I select you? My best experience ha um it was this semester, in accounting. Like he's so my professor so full of energy. He's so like fun. And he doesn't talk about accounting for two straight hours. Like he talks about other things like life and what's going on in today's society. Okay. So it gives you a little little outside yeah. and, and a little relief from the intensity of the course. Okay. All right, Leo, how about you answering this question? Let's move that microphone back. Uh, I think in English class, uh, the, the professor makes it in, uh, interesting also. She goes into detail, uh, she doesn't leave things out, and uh, she tries to stress it, stress it over and over again so we can stick it in our brains and get it. Okay. What about, what about that teacher's learning style uh, most appeal to you? Uh, she, she seems enthusiastic. Enthusiasm? Okay. Chris? Best so, learning experience? Yeah, so far as history. Because the um the whole class give me a specific time was there some some event some yeah, time that was, was better there was one class where he spoke about um Christopher Columbus and and a couple of um true things about him that a lot of people don't know 
and it was it was interesting. But I'm a freshman, so I haven't had that many classes yet. But so far. okay, so you're only here for a week or two, so you yeah. didn't have a whole lot of experience. How does it? What what if we expanded it to your high school experience? Would there have been any other learning experiences that that you would have picked? Nah. Was there ever a learning experience that was uh, that was fun? That was really caught your imagination and got you engaged? I can't remember. No. No. Okay. John. Um, I am too, as well, a freshman, and um, so far uh, I really like uh, history class. Like, regardless who the teacher is, I just like it. There's, I like the overall class. I like learning about history. Well, what, <coughs> what about the class? Why, why not like, say learn, another? I don't know. I just like learning about the past ever since I was in junior high school. I so mean, it's the subject yeah, matter. Yeah, the subject. But what about what about what happens that makes it on a specific like, day your best learning experience? Oh, like about learning about. Um, the Russian, I mean, the American Revolution, like learning about that time period, how how we got independent. Like I just, I like I like I reenacted in my mind like how everything went down. Okay. So that's it. So were you were were you listening to a lecture? Yeah, he tells us. Um, he makes he lets us read the book at night, come back and we talk over about it, and he gives us the specific details and everything. Okay, thank you, Alicia. Um, I would have to say my cultural diversity class from last semester. It was very interesting and... I'm sorry, which kind of class? Cultural diversity. Cultural diversity, okay. Yes. And there was one class where we learned about everyone else's culture, so it was very cool. And the teacher was fun, so, yeah. Okay. Elizabeth? Um, the one class that I, you know, liked the most was last semester History 100, and I really do not like history, but this class was just like, the teacher, he would tell you, he would tell you, you know, history, and then he would give his input and his opinion, and he always related to back to his country because he was from some place, like he was from Africa, so he would always like relate the history to what goes on in his culture, and it was very interesting. Okay, so they, it came alive for you. Right, it did. Was it a lecture? It was. Okay. I have two that one inside my major and one outside my major that okay. they're both good. Um, one was a psychology professor who I was a sophomore and um, you're supposed to be a junior to take the class. So he pardoned me and um, let me take the class with him. And it was, he, the way he taught everything, it was very simple. Like he made what seemed so complex to people so simple in a way that they could get it. And he kept reinforcing the issue. And um, my second one was um, my piano teacher here. He really worked with you and made you learn how to play. And he helped you to develop more of um, your musical talents. OK. Um, for me personally, I would have to say um, my speech class. Um, when I first took speech, I really, I really wouldn't have taken it if it wasn't uh, because it was a requirement, because I'm not really good at public speaking. I get like nervous and sweaty palms and all that good stuff. But, um, he made the class really interesting. He made everybody feel comfortable, and it was, it was easy to, to actually give a speech because he made everybody feel so welcome and comfortable. OK. Thank you. Um, I don't really love math, but um, my last semester, my pre class professor, she was so good. Like, right from the first day to the last day, she made her class so in interesting. Like, she, um, on the first day, she came with Skittles, like how she, I mean, she was so interesting. So we all loved the class and we all passed the class. What, yeah. what about her explicitly compared to say other teachers that you may have had made her so much more interesting to you? What, what did she do that um, made it or say? Uh, like when she comes to class, like she makes sure she talks, like she talks something about herself, like in order to keep the class from, I mean, getting i mean like sleeping or something like because it was an afternoon class like we always do something to keep us awake like so that we wouldn't sleep like what it. give me an example like sometimes she would tell us to stand up like and go around the room and do other things like she okay. wouldn't do anything that would make us fall asleep she talks loud like clear and nice like okay yeah. thank you um I can't really pick a favorite, but I guess I would have to say it would be my PE class, the PE 150. 
Um, the lecture part, the teacher, even though it was a lecture and we still had to go to the gym or whatever, um, she didn't let it just end in the gym. She would also bring it back to class and whatever we had to read or and stuff, she would make us sometimes act it out in classics, like for example, the exercises and to show the different parts of the, the body and the muscles and she would help us identify them and use them while we were in class because um, most of the people would just sit there because they say, okay, we have to take the lecture, we'll take the lecture, we're just gonna sit there. But she would have us stand up, move around, do exercises in class to keep us awake and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Stefan, oh, you, you already told us. Um, during my sophomore year, I took Psychology 215 with Professor Vanderpool, and she made the class interesting. She made it understanding. She gave us life experiences so we could understand the things better. And that's what made me decide on, upon my major. Okay. Um, a couple of semesters ago, I took a philosophy course, and the professor um, is always very excited about the uh, topic. And he always, he makes you want to actually think about it, the question and makes you want to understand the concept. So he makes what could easily be very dry and boring and very hard to understand. He makes it interesting and makes you want to figure it out. How important is a sense of humor to you in a very. class? How many people would say it's very important? Okay. Um, is anybody... Is anybody really good at, at, any of the teachers that you talked about really good at that part of it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I would like you to describe the attributes of your favorite professor. Um, we, we heard two already. I, I mentioned the sense of humor, but we already covered that and we covered enthusiasm. What other attributes are, are the most important to, for you to be engaged in, in your learning? Stacy. A sense of caring. Because when you feel that the teacher cares that you're going to you know, do good in the class and you're going to go someplace, then it makes you want to work harder to make them, I guess, happy and proud of you. If they don't care, then it's what's the point in trying. Okay. Who else? S Sabina? Um, for me, what's important is motivation, not to make you feel stupid or very, like, encouraging, you know, good work, that kind of stuff. And I'm um, also very interested in the education parts of it, not just doing it to get the syllabus over and done with, actually making you want to learn about the things, seeing how important it is. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I would say it's a teacher that is, um, <clears throat> for me, strict. I like a teacher that, you know, respects their curriculum and makes you have to, if you, if you don't do certain work, there is repercussions as towards doing it, you know, which forces you to want to do it more. How many of you agree with that? <coughs> okay, about half. All right. Yeah, no, no, it. I got it. I, I understand. Um, and, and I, by the way, you're, you're, <laughs> I'm sympathetic to that. I'm just trying to find out whether your group feels the same oh, way. Well, that's just my opinion. I don't know right. about the rest of the group. Well, I appreciate that. Anybody else have any other? Okay. Um, I would like you to, anyone who wants to offer it, your worst learning experience that you had in college. All right, especially those who were upperclassmen. You don't have to name names, don't have to tell me the class, just tell me why it was your worst learning experience. Stacy. I had this one professor. I had to end up dropping her course. She was so horrible. She, like, the way she came out toward the students was that like anything we said or any questions they asked, they were automatically wrong. And I know I had a, like a, our own thing with her because she had asked one time the question, what is racism? And I told her it's when you know, one group of people don't like another group. And she just went off on me and was like, well, you know, you don't know what racism is because you know, I guess I'm light skinned, so I don't know. And she told me to go look it up in a dictionary. And even like one student asked her like if, if North and South Africa were separated, like if they're two different countries, and she just, I don't understand why you're asking that, like with a lot of attitude. And it was just n the worst experience I've ever had in a class, because I've never had a problem with a teacher in my whole entire life until I took that class. And it just turned me off. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to talk about a, a bad learning experience? Um, it happened recently, actually, um, in a lab, the teacher, she comes in with like already upset 
and she comes in and she talks down to the students as if we're babies and like we shouldn't be trusted to even walk into the lab or even touch anything. She's like, oh, don't break it, don't break it, like constantly telling us not to break things and oh, you gotta handle it carefully as if this is the first time we're ever working with things in a lab. So yeah. Okay, Dwayne, did you wanna say something? Oh no, the microphone's making Oh, okay. All right, um, we'd like to get some questions from the audience. Anybody from the audience like to ask a question? In the back. Um, if you could dream of your Did you hear it? If you could dream up your perfect learning experience, what would it look like? Who would like to try that one? Okay. I'm thinking within my major, if the professor would bring things from her, his or her house and like teaches, I don't know, to, to help us how to use them and do it, like if we were already psychologists, you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, something like that. Stacy. Same thing, like kind of in her, like me and her have the same field, psychology. My perfect vision of them teaching with actually having people that have symptoms of like, let's say a, um, ADD or ADHD or OCD there, and we can see for ourselves how they act and how to diagnose it from ourselves, like a first-hand experience. Because it's not just about being in the classroom, it's about going outside of it and actually putting yourself out there in order to learn correctly. Okay. okay. Anybody else want to try it? Was another question in the back? Oh, here, right here. Um, classroom experiences, what is your favorite assignment that you had to do outside of class? Favorite assignment outside of class? You know, a homework or a project. Okay, Megan? Well, it was for class. Um, <clears throat> it was for cultural diversity. Um, my professor was making us um, write a play, uh, a cultural play. Like, with, we can make up our own play. And I had a, I had a really good time working with my group mates. And, um, it turned out to be a really good play, and I like it a lot. Do you, do you like working in groups? It, it depends on the people in your group. Okay. How many of you agree with that statement? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, who else? Somebody else had their hand up for a question. Yes. I actually had a question for these two ladies here, because when you asked them about um, Stephanie and Ari Slater, because when you asked them what was their worst experience, you got really, really angry. <laughs> 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 you both reacted. Were you reacting to the same class? We both, yeah. Okay. Well, our worst class was an anthropology class. Well, it's because um, the teacher, he just didn't care about what we did. or Like, he just, uh, he just, huh? class. He went into class and he would just speak and speak. And if people had certain questions, sometimes he would act ignorant and stuff. And like some assignments, is like all the assignments we did were all papers. But that's not a problem. It's just that what he wanted is not what he looked for. All he looked for was plagiarism. So it's like, I know if I, I, one of the guys that were in the class, um, he did not do plagiarism, but um, what was it? He, uh, he specifically left out what, what he wanted what the professor wanted, just to see like what he'll look for, and um, when he looked, when the professor looked at it, it was like, uh, what was it? He no, that he specifically left out certain information, and the professor was like uh, that that oh the paper is good, but you did certain pa plagiarism, but it was like it wasn't there, so he didn't look at that. All he looked for was plagiarism. So he, didn't, he doesn't read the thing, he just looks for pages. That's all he does. <laughs> it really, it's true. He, everyone failed the class just because of that. Okay. So wow. I, don't, I, don't get, I don't get how he could fail everybody and with everyone did all the work, but it's like three words, there you go, it's plagiarism. Okay. If three words just got it. Thank you. Yes. I'm not, the question is not about that, but um, I have two questions. Do you like working in groups? How many of you, raise, raise your hand if you like working in groups? And then you can add your depends. We already heard your depends. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So most of them do, it's just. And do you like Blackboard? Excuse me? Do you like using Blackboard? Oh. Not that much because sometimes it's down and then you have to turn in assignments. 
Yeah, and then it's like, it depends on Blackboard if you could do your work or not. Okay, so Blackboard is the learning management system here, I take it. And uh, how many of you have used Blackboard? All right, how many of you, let's show of hands, how many of you like the experience generally when it works? Okay, when it works. <laughs> okay, most of you do, but it's, it's a when it works kind of proposition. Yes, sir. I was just curious, we, we are always getting um, suggestions in the library from students. What about the library would you like to see change that would help you more so that you could do the work better? Besides more computers, we don't have space. Sabina? I get really upset when I come to the library and I see people looking at YouTube, on Facebook, on MySpace for three hours, and I'm trying to, you know, go use Blackboard or print something, and there's like no restriction on that, you know, like no rule or anything like that. How would you like to see it work? I would just... Uh, you get a jolt from your chair when you hit Blackboard? Or hit uh, Facebook? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, people, there's nothing wrong with Facebook, nothing wrong with YouTube, you know. It's just that people shouldn't be there sitting, you know, nine out of ten computers on YouTube okay. when someone is trying, when it's a library, it's for academic purposes, you know. It, it shouldn't, that shouldn't be given priority. Okay. So Anybody else want to? They're only for academic use. If there are students on there using Blackboard or YouTube or MySpace, come get a library and we'll kick them off. Well, that is true. It's a limited number, I think. But yes, that's exactly the problem. Anybody else want to respond to this? What? Uh, yes, Elizabeth. With the library, I think that, like, sometimes I have a break and I have nothing to do, so I go to the library. And sometimes I might have homework or I want to study something. And I might have not brought the book with me, so I go to the desk and I say, um, oh, could I have a statistics book that's on a reference? And when I get the book, it's like 50 pages are missing and the cover's ripping off. And I can, like, I wish the books were like in better condition or something. Or like, if you get the book back and it's messed up, somebody should pay for it or something because it's not acceptable. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, last question. This is the last question. Yes? Yeah, I have actually just two questions. One of them is just I'm curious. How many of you text in class? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, the follow up to that is how many of you think you should be texting in class? Oh. Okay, forget the answer to that. Then the next question is really I'm in the English department. I have a real, this is a real question. I don't know that I'm going to get the answer to this, but. Do you prefer a to submit? Do you prefer to submit your papers a electronically or b in hard copy? So a would be electronically. Show of hands. Hard copy. Uh, show, show your hands if you, you prefer. I don't want to do the papers. How about not both. The yeah. Hard copy. 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 Now, then I get it. And you want it back in hard copy, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. In 2009, you still want to give me a stack of papers. You still want me to give you back a stack of papers. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so you want to check over. Twitter and you Facebook, but I still got to deal with the hard copy. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. It's easier to write. Yeah. 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 Correct. I, I, I tells you, I think, I think that tells you that because they use different media, doesn't necessarily mean that they want you on their media. No, I agree. <laughs> so, I said I only want electronic copy, and they're all crying. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, we have, yes, do you have a question, comment? The, the thing with the hard copy is that um, what it is is that we want, I want, at least for me, I want to hand you a paper and I want to get back a paper with a lot of comments on it. Yeah. You know, the worst thing is when I hand in a paper and it comes back to me with just a grade. Oh. No comments. I can't stand that because I don't know what I did wrong, what I did right. I want to know what's good and what's not. Right. We want to see the errors, like we want the, the, the professor to show the corrections, because online you can't do that. You just write things down. You can't actually send a paper that, only if you scan it. But I mean, you can't send a paper and say, oh, this is wrong, this is right, whatever. You do, you have, do you have papers that you do in an, in an online class where everybody is sitting there writing their papers and getting mentored and, and edited even at the, at the same time? Where you, where you, somebody, you can comment upon each other's papers? Oh, you commented know? on papers? No. No, where they put up a sentence and say, who can write that sentence better? No. That kind of thing. Not that you don't do that here? Okay. 
Yeah. Just wondering. All right, before we leave, uh, this is your last opportunity to say something about your generation that you think you would like them to hear. Do you have any, any comments that, uh, based upon what you just heard? This is your faculty at the university. What do you think that they should know about you that's most important? Anybody other than what's been said, Stacy? Um, we're a generation that texts and uses emails and MySpace and Facebook and all that, but we're, I think that people look down on us because we, we're still responsible. A lot of us work, we have the GPAs, we do everything else, we volunteer and everything, and I think that generations older than us don't realize that. They think that we're more immature because we're into the computers and our cell phones, but that's not the case. We handle what we have to handle. A lot of us pay for our own college, and everything like that. So I think that we need credit. Okay. Okay, very good. Anybody else? Last chance? Thank you very much. Give them a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. We're all done.